Hi, David and Mary Sherwin. Thank you so much for joining me again on UX Cake. It's great to be here. Thanks for having us. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a few months now since the last time that we talked, and we talked a lot about teams. And since that time, you've been very busy getting ready to publish a new book that you have coming out on October 9th called Turning People into Teams. And it's all about redesigning how we work using rituals and routines. And I'd love to hear you give us a little sort of synopsis about your new book. Mary, go for it. Oh, okay. The synopsis of the book is pretty simple, which is that teams have the ability to improve pretty much any aspect of their working process by developing or creating, whichever word you want to use, rituals to get the outputs that they want. There's you know, sort of the thesis beneath the thesis, which is that there's a, a lot of talk out there right now about how we can change workplaces. And it's, you know, people are really starting to realize that teams have the power to be able to change their day to day. And we really put the book out there kind of as part of that. You don't need to wait around for a budget to help you save your team. You know, they, you don't have to wait for a great mandate. You don't have to wait for the right person in leadership. It really is something that these small moments of intention that you and your team can design together. And this book is just a series of those rituals just to get you started. And they have diagrams. I can't complain. It's like a lot of the things about how teams work together, they're very fluffy and they're not very tactical or they're not worse, they're not very tangible. So when we booked together, we wanted to be able to talk a lot about that, but also show some real diagrams that people could use to start making these rituals a thing on their team. So tell us a little bit more about what you call rituals and routines, because it's not something that's in our regular sort of organizational vernacular. The way we define the term rituals for the purposes of the book is it's a group activity where you go through a series of behaviors in a particular order and leads to a particular outcome. And ideally, that outcome is something that happens consistently over time. So the idea would be that your team has something that they do regularly. And I guess one of the things we've been thinking about is like in our lives, we see rituals crop up in our families, in our communities. Obviously, the word has religious connotation as well. But at work, there are a lot of rituals or things that we do within organizations that we kind of lose track of and we forget that they're things that we were doing for a particular purpose. And so what we're trying to do with using that term and being very deliberate about it is to help teams be a little more intentional about when they want to have these group activities, what types of outcomes they're looking for, and where that happens in the process of the project. When we talk about routines, it's something where the team has repeated or uses that ritual enough that it's part of their regular way of working. And it's not something that they're sort of being extremely deliberate about. It's something that's sort of a habit that becomes baked into the way the team works. So one of the examples of the book of how this process happens is that we've interacted with a few teams where they had a ritual whenever people were unclear about what they were trying to create with their product for their customers, someone would say, well, what problem are we trying to solve? That question would be a signal for the team to be like, oh, we should have a group conversation or a dialogue about like, what is the real problem we're trying to solve with this? Agree on what that problem looks like and then use that as something we'll build on in this product or service. Then actually in multiple cases, once these teams recognize like they needed this in place to like be really confident about the decisions they're going to make about what they're going to build. Over time, this became really routine to the point that you could be in any meeting and people would say something and be like, well, wait, what problem are we solving? And people were like, oh, in this situation, we really haven't thought that piece of it through. And it would be a, something that when people come to join the company in those first couple of weeks where you're trying to figure out your job and understand the way that organization works, you'd be like shadow meetings and you'd see this question come up and see people go through this process and be like, oh, it's part of the routine of how that organization is operating. So that's kind of the way we think about it. And every activity that's in the book, every ritual follows that sort of format where that signal or that question that leads to a team having to go through a series of steps to get to some outcome that's going to advance what they're trying to do with the team and their project thing that they're trying to accomplish together. 
So let's talk a little bit more about teams, because obviously this is about teams. It's for anyone who's in a team or who makes teams. Is this just for managers of teams or can anyone who's on a team put these practices in place? This is such a great question because when we were talking to our publisher about how we really wanted to talk about the book, about, you know, how to kind of capture the experience of the book itself. You know, there's only so many audiences that you can sell a business book to, and managers are one of them, you know, and uh, it's even better if it's a manager coming through an airport, but we had, (laughs) and it's just like, oh, hey, you know, you're flying from Boston to Chicago and you need something to read to make your time, scare quote, productive. And you can expense it too. Exactly. <laughs> but the problem that we had, and it was a good problem, it was sort of explaining that the book almost can't function that way, specifically because we do use the word rich tool and that each group or each team and each person on that team has to enter into the ritual with intention. It has to be a choice. And it can be really difficult for a manager to get a team to choose something. So we sort of face this uphill battle in being like, well, so how can we get the book to people if it's not coming from their manager? And I mean, a manager can look at it and they can invite the team. Someone who's not yet a manager, I think it's a a really powerful thing to start flexing this muscle about how the team can work together so that they're not constantly reliant on a top-down, you know, sort of surveillance of how they work. Managers are really, really great for guiding projects, but from a day-to-day perspective, the team needs a little bit more autonomy, needs a little bit more authority. So there's sort of a balance between how a manager could pick up the book and be like, yes, I want my team to do this. But at the same time, I want the people on my team to be able to sort of pick this up and run with it themselves. So I think it's going to be a little bit different for each person that picks up the book because you're not always going to be where you are now in a company. Soon you'll move up or you'll move on or you'll move over. So I think it's sort of breaking apart the hierarchy of change has to come from a person in a particular role. I think that that's something really important for us to start changing, especially in the UX and UI and design and interaction design, that one of the reasons why the field has come so far is because we started to break apart how we think about those roles. And I think that the manager report or manager team manager sort of role is one that we might want to really start to examine again. Yeah. Did that answer your question? <laughs> it did. And you know what? I want to come back to that about this idea of how an individual might work with the ideas in this book. But First, let's talk a little bit more about the ideas that are in this book. So I imagine that you have worked with a lot of teams who are, well, you talk about, you sort of break in the book, you break things into, you know, better beginnings, and then when teams are stuck. So, you know, starting from more of a position of you can start from scratch versus you've al- a team has already gotten to a place where things aren't going well. So I imagine that you have worked with lots of teams who are in that stuck phase. Would you say that you've worked with more teams that are stuck versus beginning or is that kind of? Well, it depends. And I say that because some teams we work with, there's a group of people that are in a team and they start a project where they pull together a cross-functional team to work with them. And so while they may have things they're trying to figure out, like I think a traditional example would be like, you've got a product design team and they're matrixed in with engineers and product managers and marketing and QA and lots of other disciplines trying to do stuff. In the book, we're trying to provide some tools that can be used both for all of those different configurations. And so the we're stuck part of the book or the middle part of the book, that whole area is like, what are the things that usually come up that if you haven't gone through the process of norming your team, setting expectations, figuring out what success looks like for your project, you haven't figured out what problem you're solving, they end up manifesting later in the process and you have to kind of work your way back. So we try to look at it both ways. It's like, if you're starting a new team, Here's some stuff that might be missing out of sort of your like team experience process, like the way you actually run your projects or the way you run what you're doing with your team. And then like downstream when you're actually doing the work and you've been working together for a little while, here's the stuff that usually also comes up, but some of those things can be harder to negotiate because you kind of have to back in some of those things as you go. And we give different strategies 
of ways to do that, whether it's how you give and receive feedback with your team, being a bit more uh, ritualized about how you do that, ways that you make decisions together on your team, how you increase the rigor of that and increase the clarity of the words and the way you describe the reasons why you're making decisions. Often going, like if you start in the middle, inevitably it starts hitting in those things in the beginning. But ideally, from the beginning of pulling a team together, you're doing some of the things we're recommending and it really helps. I'm curious if there is a good starting place for a team that's in the situation that is stuck. And I imagine there's not usually, in my experience, an entire team that's willing to maybe stop and kind of, you know, start over. How do teams go about teams that are not doing well or a project that is floundering? Like, what's a starting point for getting these sorts of rituals in place or starting these conversations even before you've got any rituals? I think the first thing that a team sort of has to acknowledge is the fact that, you know, it can feel like every problem that you're having right now started because of something you did five minutes ago. You know, like it's always like just out of reach, you know, like you can see where the problem started, but it's just out of reach. And I think the best place for a team to start is when did you notice that something was going wrong? And it's sort of, uh, we kind of coach teams on how to use sort of a hybrid, sort of a juiced up version of the five whys. We call it the five not whys, which is for a team to get together and it's just like, okay, something's wrong. Maybe it's a whole host of things, but at what point did you notice that something was wrong? What were the conditions? And it's not about, well, if we had just done this, we wouldn't be in this situation. Or if so-and-so hadn't done that, then we wouldn't be here. It's really just about identifying the facts and figuring out who knew what and when. And now that we have this sort of, it's not like the airing of the grievances, but giving the team a chance to say like, okay, here's the thing. This is what I noticed. This is what I saw. Moving forward, now what's our plan? Because I think, you know, it's like there is this sort of team drive to express that something's wrong and that you're frustrated by it, but we don't often give ourselves a chance as a team to be able to have a space where we can all get together and, you know, venting is not the right word because venting is only productive in a particular context. But in order to give people's experience, you know, sort of have that as a lens to look at a problem from multiple perspectives. So I think that that would be my first thing would be like, we're going to sit down and we're going to get this all out. We're going to say like, this is the state of the state for each person who's here. And now we start making plans. We prioritize which of these issues are the things that need to be tackled what our capacity is to be able to fix these, what our capability is. And if we can't fix them, and I think this is one of the secrets of really good teams, is that there are a lot of teams that can't change things. There are a lot of things that we can't fix that are out of our control. But some teams have strategies for supporting each other, despite the things that they cannot change. And so I think that that's also an integral part of it. Figuring out what you want to change, what you can change, and how to support each other through what you have no control over. Mm hmm. Yeah. You know, what you are talking about, I love that, you know, the state of a state. And I think that is a ritual that a, a team could implement in a project to check where they're going, because what tends to happen a lot is you get a postmortem, <laughs> you know, and it's like, well, that's a little too late. There's also, I think the another one of the secrets of sort of the state of the state of like discussing what the actual problem is, is making sure that everybody's really clear on what's happening that's right. What are we doing well? Because it's like, it's super easy to come in with a hatchet to fix a problem and destroy everything that's actually functioning. And I think that it's really easy for a team to develop a really robust vocabulary around all the crap that's going wrong. But it's difficult for us to talk about what's going well. And what's going well in a way that's meaningful, in a way that's not just people sitting around being nice. So I'm curious if you have advice for helping a team who's maybe the contributors in the team are aware of the problems, but the leaders of the team don't seem to necessarily be aware of the problems or maybe even open to feedback. What would be your advice to the folks on that team? I think a team needs to sit down and figure out where they're at in the project and what the expectations are between the people that may be in a manager or leadership role that might be accountable to what's happening in the team and what the team's doing. We've worked with some teams where a lot of those situations where they're just like, we're not sure what we should share with the management or we're not sure if we're being perceived as successful 
often can be traced back to a lack of really being open and discussing and understanding what the expectations are of those partners and their organization or their stakeholders, and then like what the team believes they can actually accomplish. I think once you kind of shift that vocabulary in terms of like, these are the expectations that we're actually going after as a team, and this is what it actually means if it's successful for our organization, just getting a lot of those basics in place can be extremely helpful because with a lot of the teams we've worked with, it's like the people we work with, they're generally great at their jobs. They really know what they're doing. They just get placed into a situation where the project may not have been well-defined or it's not exactly clear strategically what they're trying to do. And so there's a mismatch of understanding in the team about like, what do they expect of each other and what is the team expected to do? It's not always clear that your individual actions of what you're doing build up to something that when you're done, it's like, great, the team did what they're expected to do, not just me individually in my role. So we have a ritual in the book called What Are We Expected to Do? And the whole ritual exists for the team to sort of get out there. This is all the expectations we think we and others have for the team. What do we agree is sort of true to what we're going to take on like accountability for? And then how do we break that down into what we each individually can contribute? And visualizing that to actually put that up on a whiteboard or to put that in a shared document really shifts how the team is thinking about what's going on because those conversations are often very quick or they're at the beginning of the project. They aren't robustly discussed and we want teams to have the space to be able to figure that out because it clarifies so many things in terms of what's happening throughout what they're trying to do. And would you recommend management being involved in those kind of discussions? Because that's where expectations are coming from, but can a team be free to actually talk about what they believe with management in the room? So one of the, all the rituals in our book have a certain set of sort of principles baked into them or like how they work. And one of them is equal time, equal voice. If you're going to have managers or leaders participate in one of these rituals where you're figuring out something like this, you need to make sure that everybody that's participating has equal time and equal voice in sharing what's needed throughout that ritual. Otherwise, there's a power imbalance in terms of someone who has authority or ownership of whatever the team is doing. They might say, well, in the end, I'm the one who's the decider of what's going on. But you need everybody to have their say and to be able to debate and discuss that before you're going to sort of make the call on what's going to happen. And so that's a dynamic that's working against a lot of the behaviors we see in everyday group discussions about everything from just sort of like basic decision making to brainstorming. We tried to set up all the rituals in the book to work against those biases, to work against those existing behaviors that we see to create the space for people to feel like they actually had a voice and a choice. Yeah, something that you said reminds me of something that caught my attention in the book about debating and discussion. And you talked about, you referenced another book, blanking on the name, David Kasner? who has a book about players. David Cantor. (laughs) So yeah, you referred to a book by David Cantor about kind of the players that are in a conversation and learning how there's, you know, the four types of people who are in a conversation or in a debate and learning how to be a better debater or learning how to have a better discussion. Can you tell me a little bit about that? And because this, I think this loops back around to how individuals can, if there's an individual contributor who's listening to this and they want to use this book to make their situation, their team better, what can they do on their own if the team hasn't already joined this idea? Well, the thing with Cantor is that it really is about sort of the speaking role or the role that you take in a conversation. And so when we teach the four-player model to our students, We have some students and they're always the same. You know, it's always the movers and the bystanders. They're like, oh, that's me. I am a mover. It's like, oh, okay. Well, actually what it is, is that your tendency in particular conversations is to act as a mover. However, it will shift every 30 seconds sometimes. Sometimes you're a bystander and then all of a sudden you have something really important to say and you shift into a mover role. I think it's important for people to really understand that those roles shift. So even if you have somebody who's the, you know, I'm in charge and I can fire you all at a moment's notice, that they're actually kind of shifting back and forth between, you know, that one person who's saying no all the time to the one person who's saying follow me all the time. 
from an individual contributor perspective, so I freelanced for many years and this was always my thing where it was just kind of like, there's so many things that I cannot fix. <laughs> and it's like, I'm here to do this one thing. And at the same time, I feel like I'm putting frosting on mud pies. Like it's very difficult. But I think what can happen, especially with some of the rituals, is that, you know, like David was saying earlier, there's a question that cues each ritual. And that's how all of the rituals are, all the titles of the rituals in the book have a question. And from an individual contributor perspective, that's the way to do it, which is one question at the right time. It's like, choose the hill you want to die on. You know, do you want to die on the, I am asking the question, what problem are we trying to solve? I am asking the question, what can we change? What can we not? And see how it goes. And the great thing about having something like the four player model is that you can throw that into a situation, introduce it to people and have it just be a really, really artificial thing. And that's how we usually teach it. So it's like, okay, for this whole critique, you are going to be the mover and you let people get to experience this different type of role that they could play a different way of speaking for 30 seconds, you know, but the individual contributor, it's like pick the hill and pick the thing that you actually think is going to work on a result for you as well, not just personally, but professionally. And I think that even though we say all of the rituals are for teams, there are plenty of places in the rituals that you could test run it yourself for you and say, what problem am I trying to solve? by doing this, by asking X question. So asking one of the questions in the book is something that really resounds with you as you're reading the book, starting with yourself. Is that what you mean? Absolutely. Because I think what it is, is that even it's like from an individual perspective, it's like, if you're lucky to be coming in at one point, that's great. Sometimes you're there for two weeks right in the middle and it's always awkward. Sometimes you're there to be cleanup crew at the end and that's kind of always awkward too. But you're always running into the same particular type of problem and your brain sees those particular types of problems. So one question is more resonant for you than another would be for another person. So it's like, ask that question, see what resonates with your own experience with that particular project and see what happens. Have you ever gotten pushback from teams that you've worked with that these rituals sound like too much process or overhead? I would say this. We don't walk in to work with the team and say, take our book and now you're going to turn to page 47 and you're going to do this ritual we try to understand how they work, what they're trying to accomplish, and then like what specific problems they might be struggling with. From there, we might only introduce a piece of one of the rituals or just like one or two small things to try and build from there. We can't assume that like a ritual for a team that's averse to process, that they're going to be like totally bought into doing something huge. So it might just start with like, hey, in this conversation where you're having this debate, what if you tried this one little tactic? And then when they respond to that saying, great, well, if that worked for you, what's here's another thing you could add to that. And then over time, we see that build up into something where it starts to in influence the culture enough that's just like, well, you're kind of doing something that looks like these rituals. There's some other ones you could try and that you can kind of plug them in more easily in terms of what they're trying to accomplish. And so would you recommend for a, a person, an individual, or maybe a small team that is trying to get traction in an environment that is, you know, kind of pushing back on this, that they start almost like guerrilla fashion, <laughs> so kind of what you, it sounds like, you know, you're just kind of slip it in without calling it a ritual. Yep. You said it exactly. It's like, I've been in a number of meetings over the past five or six years where we would be testing stuff that would end up being in this book. And it'd just be a matter of like, hey, you know, before we get into this conversation, everybody take five minutes to write down what you're thinking about this on sticky notes. I was going to say, then from there, it just builds into like, okay, great. Now let's put it all up on the whiteboard in this way. And once people recognize that they had a chance to really get a better range of perspective, it's just like, why don't we do this more often? It's like, well, where could we do this more often? And that's usually the way we get to the point where you can like put on top of that something that's a little bit heavier in terms of like doing something around a topic, like setting expectations or making a decision. Yeah, I think how a person might bring these ideas to a team is probably, it's very important that you understand kind of the dynamics of your team before you sort of suggest any one of these questions. Yes, and 
they might be already doing activities that are roughly like or similar to some of the rituals in the book. And that can make it easier to be like, well, we're doing a retrospective next week. There's another format we could try and we're feeling a bit stale. Let's try it this other way. I mean, we've had teams <laughs> that have had this sort of like, if they're a little wackier, if they're a little weirder, we've encountered teams that have thumb wrestled around you know, whether or not they want to do one question or another question to start a ritual, you know, where someone would be like, hey, I was thinking about doing this one thing. And it's like, if you want to change something, it's like you literally have to thumb wrestle someone and win a thumb war in order to be able to do it. You could totally tell this is a Silicon Valley company, can't you? Because like nobody would do this anywhere else. I think what it is, is that for some of the larger, more the rituals that could be perceived as being a little more explosive. We talk about confidence voting and, you know, how to express criteria, talking about behaviors rather than values. We designed those very carefully so that we weren't asking people to subvert the authority of their company. We didn't want to put people in danger, sounds like a really extreme thing to say, but we didn't want to put teams in danger. We wanted that if somebody found a copy of this book and was like, what is this? We wanted them to be able to be comfortable in saying, this isn't about changing things. This is about making them stronger or making them better. And I can prove that it works. Because I think that's the other thing is that it's very difficult to get a lot of people to want to change something unless you can prove that it's going to work. But like, how can you prove? You know, it's like you can't A, B test it, right? You just have to try it. So the sort of gorilla aspect about it really is getting the team to have a minute or two to test one particular aspect, get some data, get some success, and then to be able to prove it to others. And you know what? If the whole department doesn't want to change, if the whole org doesn't want to adapt this particular ritual, yeah, who cares? It's like, if it works for your team, that's what's important. Yeah, and I can see that you could even use these tactics in working with individuals. You know, like if you, I often have people that I've worked with in the past in mentoring situations that are having trouble with a person maybe on another team. So like a designer who's having issues with a developer or with a particular PM. So I think, you know, you could use a similar sort of approach to when you, you know, after you read this and you read these wonderful questions that a team could be asking, that might be a question that you could ask this other person within a conversation between two people. I'd say yes. And some of the early readers and testers of the material, when we got to like the first draft and then the second draft, they would use it with their direct reports to try to improve how they would give and receive feedback. That's one of the rituals in the book that's written to be like, this is something you might actually do in private first, or you might do one-on-one -on -one in conversations, and then it would build up to a team habit or behavior. And then there's rituals around what a whole team would do working with feedback. But some of these rituals could work in a scenario where people are trying to align on something. Like if you and your manager are trying to align on like what it means for you to lead with intention, what are the behaviors of how you're going to demonstrate how you want to be a leader? If you're trying to figure out what your expectations are of each other and then how that's supporting the team you work on. If you're like a group of product managers and you're managed by a VP and the VP and the individual product managers are saying like, okay, what are our expectations? What does that mean for the team? Let's bring that together. We want, people to feel comfortable using the rituals that way, but they had been written first and foremost for a situation where you've got everybody pulled together and there's some situation that something burning that has to be addressed and the team needs to have that conversation out in the open. So it sounds like this book isn't just for people who lead teams and people who work in teams, but basically anyone who works with another person. I think the book is written more specifically for a bunch of people thrown together on a team, but I think what you described is fair and that any sort of like direct people that you work with, there are some rituals in the book that would help to improve your day-to-day -day working relationships. Yeah, I definitely saw that looking through it. Well, David and Mary, as we come to a close, are there any other things about this book or the thing, you know, all the wisdom that's in this book? It's too much to talk about in half an hour or 45 minutes. But 
Anything else that you want to make sure people know about? There's an audio book. Okay, so I say this and not because the audio book is me. So we recorded the audio book, just like put together a little home studio in our basement and recorded it. But this became a really important aspect of the book because David and I are very concerned with how accessibility works in our workplace teams and how we think about inclusion, you know, anything from assistance to accommodation to just, you know, change in general. So when we put together the audio book, you know, from you've seen the book, so you know that there are a lot of diagrams in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We sat down and we scripted visual descriptions of all of the diagrams so that anyone could essentially have a picture or be able to draw out or be able to build a structure in their minds of what these diagrams look like, of where the information sits in space. It was really important for us that the audiobook be at least an equivalent experience to just the physical text. It was really difficult. I mean, we had these moments where it's like you're having to describe it visually, you know, so In the left column, there is blah, blah, blah. In the right column, there is blah, blah, blah. But you're also having to explain the abstract concept of what the diagram is supposed to represent. It was really eye-opening for us because, you know, it's like we had to really do our homework. Like we had to make sure that our diagrams really were what we were intending them to be. Did you go back and change any of your diagrams after? I'm just curious as an aside. We have one ritual that did not make it into the book that we have changed the diagram for just because the representation of it does not match the intention of the ritual. But we lucked out on the others. It was nice. Yeah. And I'll throw in that we recognize, I guess we did a peer review in this book. Our publisher is really good. They have a lot of different people from different roles read through your book and give you feedback. And we got a lot of feedback around the customization of the book. So you'd mentioned like, how would you introduce this to a team and like the language that you would use? And there's a lot of vocabulary and ways of framing this stuff that's very unique to organizations. And we've recognized this with a lot of the companies we work with. So we flipped the content into a toolkit and it's all editable. So people can like purchase all the materials that are in the book and they can customize it to their organization. And that was something that came out with some of the people that were reading through the whole book and it's like final draft state. They said, whoa, I just, I want all of this and I want the ability to be able to like make it my organizations and like get it into, if I can just get the vocabulary in line with how we work and add in some of the things we do, this would be like the way that we'd run our teams. And we're just like, oh. (laughs) And where can people find that toolkit? It's available through a publisher. I think the web address is bkconnection.com slash into teams. Is the link in your book? It is in our book. (laughs) And we will link to it in the show notes as well. But I think I would imagine that reading the book would be a really important sort of predecessor to running with that toolkit because, you know, you really are explaining. Like you said, you've got lots of diagrams and it's very hands-on. Here's some techniques you can use. It's not you know, you don't have to spend hours in theory before you run with this. So it sounds like the toolkit really is just goes in conjunction with the book. Yeah, totally agreed. We believe that if people get steeped with sort of like understanding the very basics, and we tried at the beginning to just have like, here's the minimum that you need to sort of get running with one of these things, and you could just drop it into trying it with the team. The toolkit is really for like, if you see value in it, here's a way that you can make it your own and not have to be like, we're using this from a third party. You can be like, this is something that is part of our way of working and we've adapted it for our needs. We really didn't want anything to stand in the way of adoption. And I personally have worked with companies where, oh, this would be great, but you know, since we don't have it in a PowerPoint, I don't really see how we can use it, that that's actually a barrier to change. And I (laughs) wish that that way of thinking had gone, but it really hasn't. And so the toolkit is just sort of the, you know, we want to get rid of all of those roadblocks for you so that you can really make this your own and that your team can really make it what they need it to be. And that all of the corporate necessities, we can help you take care of those. You guys have really considered all the details. 
which is not surprising. <laughs> Do you have, so this is launching, your book is, I almost said your book is launching. Your book is coming out. It's going to be available for purchase, published on October 9th. So are you doing any speaking events? Can people come and hear you talk in any places about your book? We're doing some stuff in the Bay Area. And that's happening in mid-October. Other than that, we've just been really been heads down on producing the content. And there's a bunch of articles and things that are going to be coming out around the book in the month of October. Past that, we're just having a ton of conversations with folks directly about how they can be using the material. And my hunch is in the new year, there'll be a bunch of things that we'll be doing to help share the material. And I think for this type of book, it would be more so around hands-on training and getting a chance to try things out and then getting some advice on, okay, if I'm going to bring this into my organization, how would I think about doing that? That's really the path for us. It's like you're saying, it's really a hands-on book. So we want to have people get hands-on opportunities to use what's in there. Yeah, it's not a spine-tingling, riveting read, you know, so it's not something that we can, you know, just like pop up and do a reading. So I guess we should, you know, figure out some sort of song or performative aspect that we can do with it. That's kind of nice, you know, that it really, anything that we're doing event-wise is really just an opportunity to let people talk about what's happening, you know, so that we can be sort of true to the name of our company, you know, ask the short one. We should come up with a song. Yeah, we should. (laughs) Well, I will say, however, although it is not like a novel or mystery thriller, You guys are both very good storytellers, and that comes through in this book. This is not a dry, kind of like, put you to sleep sort of book. So (laughs) I'll throw that in there. I don't know if you need a song, but there's nothing wrong with having a song. (laughs) Yep, we're going to get started on that right away. (laughs) So remind us how we can follow you online. We have a mailing list, and you can sign up on our website, asktheSherwins.com. We have a Twitter feed at Ask the Sherwins, and that is often where we share what is going on. But for the folks that are on our mailing list, we often put things through there first before we release them into the wild. So it's your chance to get your hands on that first. And it is the the plug to go to the website at least once a month because we have an advice column that we put out every month, but at the end of the month, it disappears. So there's no archive. You have to go on the mailing list or you have to go to the website once a month in order to be able to read the advice column. Sign up for Ask the Sherwins at asktheSherwins.com. Um, it's definitely worth it. There's always wonderful questions and thought-provoking answers, very useful answers. Okay. Thank you so much, David and, and Mary. I'm super excited about your book and that you've brought more of your wisdom to our community. So it's been really fun talking with you guys. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you.